The 2015 animated movie Inside Out tells the story of an 11-year-old girl named Riley during an emotionally difficult time when her family moved from Minnesota to California. It's a time of loss for Riley, not only leaving behind her friends, but also leaving behind her childhood as she moves into puberty. We follow her and her family through these transitions, but the real stars of the movies are Riley's emotions. Anger, disgust, fear, sadness, and joy. All depicted by the glorious Pixar animator, animators. Peter Docter is the Pixar producer of the film, and he initially decided that joy and fear would be the dominant emotions, that joy and fear would create the dynamic tension that would motivate the story. He chose fear because he knew there was humor that could be derived from it. But a ways into the production, he realized that fear was not going to offer the lessons that were needed to resolve the story. He realized that sadness needed to be the star. So to help reset the story, he recruited two University of California psychologists to serve as advisors. There's a New York Times article about the movie and these psychologists are quoted in it. They said that the sadness needed to be the star because the movie is about loss and is guided when people have feelings of sadness. Sadness, these psychologists say, is associated with elevated physiological arousal, activating the body to respond to loss. Now they did quibble with the frumpy way that sadness is portrayed in the movie. If you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. The joy character is literally dragging sadness around. In real life, they say it's actually the opposite because sadness can pull people in to comfort and help. I have to admit that I was surprised about this information about the positive nature of sadness. I didn't think that sadness was a bad emotion, just one of those feelings we experience as humans. I didn't appreciate that sadness can be constructive, that sadness can encourage growth. In Inside Out, Riley's sadness lets her recognize the changes she is going through, what she has lost, and sets the stage for her to develop new facets of her identity. So the central insight of the movie, and one that the psychologist's research support, is that sadness can clarify what is lost and help us to move forward. And yet, many among us avoid sad feelings or push them aside. There's a Harvard psychologist, Susan David, who surveyed 70,000 people and found that a third of the respondents judge themselves for having so-called bad emotions like sadness or anger or even grief. Or people actively try to push aside those feelings. She said, we do this not only to ourselves, but also to the people we love, like our children. We may inadvertently shame them out of emotions that seem negative, or jump to a solution and fail to help them see these emotions are inherently valuable. We heard a bit about that in Heather's reflection. In my experience, it is true that many people avoid difficult feelings like sadness or judge themselves as weak for having these feelings. Our culture teaches us to put on a happy face. There's even a song about it. And yet, many of us enjoy sad movies, sad books, music. We even seek them out. They can serve as vehicles to help us regulate and release our feelings. 
connecting with a character in the book, experience their emotions through them can make us feel less alone. For many, melancholy music expresses our feelings in ways that can't be expressed in words. I don't know about you, but I spent a few hours in my teenage years listening to really depressing music. <laughs> Feeling sad can also help us develop resilience. At my congregation in the last few years, we've talked a lot about resilience, how we develop it, how we work through our challenges to be stronger and more resilient people. So much in our world is challenging. And we need to develop resilience in order to thrive and to be effective change makers in these challenging times. Part of developing resilience is honoring these difficult emotions like sadness to allow ourselves to learn from them. But let's take it just a little bit deeper. In our lives, we often experience more than one emotion at a time. A friend of mine calls these double feelings. And one of the most poignant double feelings is bittersweet, both joy and sorrow at the same time. Susan Cain wrote an entire book on this topic, a, the book that inspired me to write this sermon. I shared a reading from that book a few minutes ago. According to Cain, bittersweet feelings involve a tendency to states of longing, poignancy, and sorrow, an acute awareness of the passing of time, and a curious, piercing joy at the beauty of the world. As we heard in the reading, bittersweet is also a quiet force, a way of being, as dramatically overlooked as it is brimming with human potential. It's an authentic and elevating response to the problem of being alive in a deeply flawed, yet stubbornly beautiful world. Does that sound familiar? Is anyone living in that world? Deeply flawed and yet stubbornly beautiful. So here we are in this deeply flawed, stubbornly beautiful world giving us many opportunities to experience bittersweet feelings. Opening ourselves up to bittersweet feelings can help us to integrate our life experiences. Some of the most bittersweet feelings come in life's transitions, in letting go of something. I remember when I graduated from high school, it was just after the ceremony I was standing there next to a friend, still wearing my cap and gown, my diploma tucked under my arm. I was looking out over the crowd, and I had this intense, bittersweet feeling that life was never going to be the same again. Of course it wasn't. I was heading off to college in a few months, leaving home, leaving behind friends, family, and the familiar patterns of life. I was feeling sadness and excitement at the same time. And giving those feelings room helped me to let go and to be prepared for the next phase of my life. Earlier this year, I was on medical leave for about a month. And those of you who have time off know that one of the favorite pastimes is binge watching things on TV. So as I'm healing, I watched 50 episodes of The Crown. <laughs> I kind of lived with those monarchs for a few weeks. This is the Netflix series about Queen Elizabeth and the royal family of Britain. And there was one episode that really stood out for me. It was just after Charles and Diana had gotten divorced, and he shows up at her house. They hadn't seen each other or spoken to each other in quite a long time. And he actually seems confused as to why he's there. But it was soon clear, at least to us, the viewer, that he wanted to be with her to process the dissolution of their marriage. The scene was incredibly poignant as they reflected on what could have been and what actually was. 
There was laughter, sweetness, sadness, relief, and longing. And there was grief. This is what we do as humans. This is what we should do for our emotional health. Reflect on the joys and the sorrows, on what might have been, to not shy away from these bittersweet feelings. Of course, their conversation ended in an argument, but it didn't negate the poignancy of their sharing. Those of you who have known grief know it is a particular form of bittersweet. We think of grief as only sadness, but it's actually a combination of sadness, joy, and longing. Joy in the memories of the one we lost and the longing for them to return. When we're in the throes of grief, it's hard to believe that we are learning and growing in this process, but we are. In the poignancy of grief is an acute awareness of the interconnection of life and death, the interconnection of sorrow and beauty. Some of our deepest bittersweet feelings come from our awareness that the gift of life is balanced with loss and death. Awareness of our own impermanence and the impermanence of all we love makes life rich, alive, and bittersweet. Socrates and the Greek Stoics from antiquity had a practice that helped them be more present with life. Memento mori, remember death. I was on a Zoom call with somebody the other day and he had a t-shirt that said memento mori and I actually needed to talk to him about that. Buddhism, Sufism, and the early Christians all had practices of reflecting on death as a way of engaging more deeply in life. There's a website called The Daily Stoic. Did you know that? The Daily Stoic? A lot of wisdom comes from there. And from, from one of their posts, they said, to us moderns, memento mori sounds like an awful idea. Who wants to think about death? But what if instead of being scared and unwilling to embrace this truth, we did just the opposite? What if reflecting and meditating on that fact was the simple key to living life to its fullest. The 13th century Sufi poet Rumi had some ideas to offer us about living with the awareness of death. He has a poem called, What Does It Mean to Walk with Death? In that poem he says, you can walk with death, an uninvited guest climbing hand over fist with a closed throat up the mountain. You can make yourself an apprentice at the feet of that brutal, beloved teacher learning lessons sorely needed, knowing that fall lives in the spring seed. For how can you really be saying hello to each moment without a goodbye on the tip of your tongue. Life and death, death and life, bittersweet. Our culture encourages us to minimize darker emotions, to strive to be positive and happy regardless of how we really feel. But that is not how life unfolds. Life is joy, life is sorrow. It is loss and growth. It is beauty and pain. Our resilience, our ability to live fully and richly in this challenging life comes from our awareness of our sorrows. It comes from our ability to process our feelings, good and bad. I wish you this richness of spirit. I wish you this deepening this engagement with what is truly bittersweet, what is joy and sorrow woven fine into a life worth living. Blessed be.